So this next session is entitled uh, Scripting. And I like to think of scripting as writing small programs that have high leverage. That is, programs that allow you to manipulate big systems and get big complicated things to do what you want with a small amount of effort. And of course, that's something that Racket's great at. And that's the sort of thing that Byron is going to tell us about in more senses than one that's, uh, in, actually, in this talk. So that's, that's Byron just, Davies. That's just what we need. And in fact, um, the reason that we chose Racket, or I chose Racket for, for these applications, or one of the reasons, was uh, Jay McCarthy's talk at last year's RacketCon, where he demonstrated just how much you can possibly do with as little code as possible. And that's exactly what, what we need to do in, in some of this. So, so I'll get on with it. I'm new to kind of new to the Racket community. It's Byron Davies, of course. Um, I've had the usual you know, techie training, Caltech, MIT, Stanford, where I got a PhD for developing ontology of semiconductor manufacturing. Worked at Texas Instruments, where I helped to bring the LISP machine to reality. The, Texas, the TI Explorer LISP machine, LISP machine to reality. Worked at Motorola, where we developed LISP-based and web-based tools for manufacturing. Um, it was very, very early on, about 1995, so it was uh, pretty early on there. I've been working a number, number of startups since. Um, let me tell you about um, the three things here. I talked a little bit, just a tiny bit about spreadsheets. I'm not even going to show a slide, though. Um, when, I, when I offered to give a talk here, I offered um, Vincent three topics. And one was the spreadsheet topic, well, actually, these, these three topics. And at the time, um, the, the last two were kind of in their infancy, and so, so Vincent recommended we go with the first one because it was, it was actually kind of concrete and, and easy to understand. Um, but he agreed with me that um, at this point, we'll probably go ahead with the, we're more with the other two. So to make the spreadsheet topic short, um, basically we created an object-oriented spreadsheet. Uh, we needed it for, in fact, I work at a school called Starshine Academy. We needed it for analyzing some, some school performance data and it worked very well. And um, since I did that, it's now uh, kind of disappeared into history. And it'd be interesting to think about integrating, because I know somebody did a, a, a GUI for it, for, a sp for spreadsheets and so on, but um, not, not to this session. The formal methods I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, oops, oops, didn't want that. Oh, well. Um, I'm part of a company called Ontopilot. You can find it at ontopilot.com. And basically, we're developing tools to analyze software. So static analysis of software, and a lot of people are doing that. Um, we have a couple of edges. One, we have um, a fellow who's been, one of our partners is a fellow who's been working in the area for um, about 20 years, um, who personally knew you know, Dijkstra and Hoare and, and a lot of the other people in the field, had developed the things, actually built a concept successful company in 2000 or before 2000 for the Y2K problem and, and did static analysis of software and made a lot of money, had a company of 600 people. So we have some background in this. So we, were, we came to, we were been working on it, we were theorizing about it, but we finally decided we need to do a prototype. So we did the prototype in Racket, of course. Um, simple, simple flow and you can't really see it from where you are, but you start with the running program S, you find, find all the code that's, or pardon me, so you go out and find the program. So you got a problem in S, you go out and find the program, you, um, then expand it into all the software that, that's really relevant to that program. You do a, actually do a conversion to uh, Dijkstra Goddard commands, which then makes it very easy to, to transfer it to logic and then do some powerful analyses. And so our, our flow in and complete flow adds a couple more steps where we do a weakest precondition analysis, do the logical analysis of the program, and then and then use that to find the faults. At some point, we have to, we have to identify a point, a, a point in the program and specify a post condition at that point. It's got to be, got to be true um, so that that fault wouldn't have occurred. And you can use that to track down to where that, that precondition was not um, or was invalidated. We've also, this the red down here says we, we actually did our prototype in, in Racket. And so we now have a system that takes a Racket program, um, gathers together all the Racket code that it needs. Um, Converts it to Racket syntax. Thank you for all the syntax developers. Uh, converts it to from syntax to Dijkstra guarded commands, then to logic, and then we're a little fuzzy on the end things because we really haven't haven't done them yet. But um, one of the important things 
about what we're doing, why we think we have a ch better chance than other people, is that Micron um, is current has is now just now coming out with a a um, massively parallel finite state automata. Um, on, on one ship, there's 256,000 automata, and uh, we think that's going to be of assistance in helping to um, perform the logical operations, particularly simplification on large logical expressions. Um, one of the things we use, you can't, you can't really see this, but what we did was, um, since it was kind of difficult to, to visualize all this stuff, instead of just using print statements to debug, we um, actually ganged together seven instances of the macro browser, wait a minute, syntax browser. Um, and so we, we visualized the entire flow, flow through the system. And so that stretched over you know, long screen. I really need one of those um, more than HD screens in order to, to play with this. And the details aren't important, but, but um, basically span it out to, into, pro, into deeper in programs and intermediate language, which is syntax, and then into, um, into logic. Well, what I really want to talk to you about, what I want to get you really excited about, is our work on the XPRIZE. And this is a different organization. This is now back to Starshine Academy. It's this little school in Phoenix, Arizona. And we're competing for what's called the Global Learning XPRIZE. And this was a new XPRIZE. The first XPRIZE was the, was the one for um, getting man into space, or privately getting man into space. So a fellow named Peter Diamandis offered $10 million to the first company to get somebody into space and get them back. And sure enough, some companies, or some companies tried and succeeded, and one of them collected the $10 million. Mind you, they spent over $100 million to do it, but it, it did have the effect of inspiring a new space race, a private space race. So last, there's been other X Prizes since. Um, next week, they're going to announce, I think, the winner for the tri-quarter X Prize for $30 million. So it's, it's kind of an exciting deal. Well, last fall, they announced the Global Learning X Prize, which is a X Prize for developing the best tablet-based software to help young kids learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the age is seven to ten years old. There's some other constraints on it that um, the um, software has to be open source. And and there's a little problem here. It also has to be run on Android tablet. So we'll have to we'll have to work on that. Um, there's a schedule, um, details you can't see, but um, basically there's 18 months design and build. There's going to be some, some space in the, in the middle to evaluate. It's gonna, they're going to identify five finalists, and then there's going to be 18 months of field testing where they'll actually try, try it out and see which one is the best solution. The awards are the, each of the five finalists gets a million dollars. The, fi the final winner gets 10 million. And apparently there's an extra five million for women-owned teams, for women-managed teams, and of which one is ours. So there's, so there's substantial money out here. The real goal is to eliminate, el eliminate illiteracy worldwide. And this is a, a technological step towards that. And you can find out more about that at, uh, at, X or at XPRIZE and, and at the XPRIZE forum. So, so what are we doing in this? Um, well, we selected Racket as the platform, partly based on just the success of Racket at, at, uh, at uh, real and imagined applications. Um, but we know, and we've, we're facing this as a, as a charter school in Arizona, education is broken, and not, not just here in the United States, but globally. We don't want the XPRIZE to be exclusively about the three R's. We think that you know, we, we offer a holistic education. We think that the, the solution should have a component of that. We have a great team just just by luck and uh, persistence, we have a great team of systems thinkers, computer scientists, et cetera, working around us who are volunteering their time to work on it so far. Uh, we have our own laboratory because we have a school, and so we can go walk down the hall and just uh, try things out. And uh, we think that the solution ultimately will be as valuable for our students as for all the other students around the world. So how are we computing, competing? Um, we're taking a slightly different tack from a lot of the teams. Um, there's 198 teams around the world that are, are competing for this. Because it's open source, the big companies have elected not to get involved with it, but there's a lot of other, a lot of other people involved. Um, so, so, so other, other people are taking kind of a software-oriented approach. That is, a, just starting to develop stuff in hopes they'll eventually roll into a solution. We took a 
kind of different approach that, all right, we need a theory of learning. We need to figure out what to, what's the best way of learning this stuff, and then we'll figure out how to get it onto a computer. The theory of learning, we've got to figure out what the content is going to be. Um, we need to design the experience. We need to design the overall system because this isn't, this isn't just one, one kid with a tablet. There's a bunch of other people around them um, that may either help or hinder them. And then, of course, there's the programming, which uh, we need to get to. So in the theory of learning, we, we investigated black swans of learning. And by black swan, I mean examples of learning that are so productive and powerful that they strain credulity. You almost can't believe them. I mean, the first example that, that I knew about was a language learning, a language teacher, a fellow named Michelle Thomas, who could one-on-one -on -one teach somebody a new language in three days. And that's, that's obviously can't be the whole language. You know, limited on nouns, but he taught basically the verb, verb structure and pronoun structure and a few nouns in three days, 20 verbs, or 20, 20 tenses on hundreds of verbs, and did it across multiple different languages. So I thought, well, reading can't be much different from learning a new language, so let's look for solutions like that for reading. And um, we actually found one. We were working with a, with a fellow who's got a method for teaching reading in 12 hours, T taking a, making a, a little kid, and the kid may, probably knows the alphabet, but beyond that, doesn't know how to read. Teach how to read English in 12 hours. And English is one of the most difficult languages in the world to read. So they found, found um, solutions in math and reading and, and also in another area. And what we found the central theme is this notion of guided discovery. Um, and it turns out that just teaching stuff, lecturing doesn't work. But neither does just letting the kid go and try to figure out the world by themselves. They need, there has to be a guided component to it. And so we're working on that. We developed relationships with um, key collaborators, um, bicoastally in this country and in Canada as well. And we've begun testing the pre-technology solutions at our school. So why Racket? Well, why use anything but the second best programming language? It's powerful, cohesive, solid, reliable, interactive, graphical. It's parenthesized. I have 40 plus years of programming lists. So so I kind of favor the parentheses. And then has an excellent execution environment. Um, and the summary for that is it's batteries included. Um, one of the cool things that um, we came across was PICTS. Now here's, here's this thing. This is a gra graphical object. And if you can size it and scan it. You can, you can put multiple objects into it and make one PICT out of it and so on. And um, so that was, that was an interesting concept. Also, so all languages must have, I mean, all graphical languages must have something like that. But what was cool was that they're in the REPL. So, so you can do some evaluation and play around, and then it generates a pic. So you see it right there. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. And another, another thing that we're, we're just beginning to look at, and just, this just occurred to me in the last week, um, thinking about this, this conference, is that part of our job is to be in the publishing business, that we're going to have to create and display content for kids um, in very flexible ways, which I'll show you, show you in a minute. And so we may need something like Pollen, which is available basically as part of Racket, um, to do that for us. So another thing about why Racket. So, so we're working on the reading, the reading application and I'm working with this brilliant uh, reading theorist on, on the West Coast, and working with her for, for a couple of months, and really developing software. You can import the CMU pronouncing dictionary, and can do lots of interesting things. Created a, an app to display uh, sounds on the screen, so you click on them and hear what the sound is supposed to be, things like that. But there's something, something a little bit wrong with her solution, and I don't mean to, to cause her problems, but she had, she had created this phonetic alphabet that was basically numbered 1 to 39. So it was, it was hard to remember which sound was which. And I was thinking, well, after a couple of months, I couldn't remember which was which, so how are kids going to remember it? So, so, that, so we might as well use, use a, look for a phonetic alphabet or a graphical alphabet. And it turned out there was a guy in Philadelphia who had a graphical alphabet for, for um, reading. And so, so actually, over the, over the course of a weekend, I had all, all this infrastructure already built, and I learned about PICs and how they worked and so on. And so, so, so I sent, sent this to, to the, the fellow in Philadelphia. He said, oh, gee, this is this exciting accomplishment just over the weekend. And what it says is, 
sentence to phonetics, this is more fun than sex. And so, so feather is the, is the the symbol, because the the is in the middle of feather, and igloo is the is symbol, and uh, four is the more symbol, because that's the end of more, and um, umbrella is the a uh symbol, and you can figure it out. And uh, so we, uh, so we got, got that far, but it turns out that's, that's only the first step in his reading. The first step in his reading is to get kids to read with a phonetic alphabet. And that doesn't take long. It only takes, it takes a, a few hours. And then the next step is to, to develop a scriptable form of the phonetic alphabet so that you can actually write it by hand if you wanted to. And he, he was doing this with tutors so that he would use it to annotate text with the phonetic characters. So the igloo is just a curve, curved, concave downward and the four stays the same, the umbrella turns into something much simpler, the man turns into something, and, and, and so on. So it has this phonetic alphabet. Well, the invention here was, oh, it's all great. You have a phonetic alphabet, so how do you learn English? Well, he took something from, how much time do I have? Three more minutes? Yeah, almost done. He took something from that the Muslims and Arab, the Arab Muslims had developed uh, a little over a thousand years ago, and that was diacritics. The, the, the Muslim or the Arabic, Arabic alphabet doesn't have vowels. So it's very kid, hard for kids to learn the Quran, and so um, they discovered putting diacritics in, in the lines above the above the text for the vowels. And um, other people inherited that like, uh, after that, but it didn't appear in English until about five years ago. And so the next step on this is to present the English, and then provide the diacritics as training wheels for the kids to, to um, see what the sounds are. And this isn't important for probably for any of those, but if you have a, a syllable like O-U-G-H, there's lots of possible sounds, pronunciations for that, and kids can really stumble on that. And then, then there's another step. I thought, well, we might as well do a graphical alphabet. So he, he actually recycled the, the consonants and said, well, kids can learn consonants. But in, in my classroom experimentation, I found that kids that's a whole other phase. They need to learn the consonants, so develop an alphabet for that too. So there's a bunch of projects, and there are more than this that we're interested in getting done in Racket, um, porting, porting Racket to Android, um, implementing these um, learning systems um, in three areas: math, early reading, and systems thinking. Um, developing an architecture to manage the whole the whole system. A math exercise generator generate because there's this fellow who did the math solution has thousands of exercises out there, but we ought to be able to compress that down so we can have a generator for it. And then finally publishing, publishing this, this text um, rather than using, or in a, in a beautiful way, rather than the, some of the ugly ways that I showed there. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're excited about it. Um, I just, uh, like an hour ago, I got a call from my CEO that, that uh, she's, she's been out looking for, for money to fund this. And she called an hour ago, so says she's, through, through the XPRIZE organization, she's hooked up with an investor in Hong Kong who may put money into this. But even, even if we don't have money, um, we're certainly open to, to gain sharing, that if we win the moolah, then, then we'll, we'll share it with um, developers. So if anybody's interested in, in doing some exciting application-oriented projects, we've got them, and there may, might even be money in it. Thank you. <laughs>